Welcome to the Tony Wilson Fishing Show. Yes, I love going fishing in my small boat. This was not in my small boat. This is in another gentleman's boat. I'm going down to New Haven, see if I can get you guys some more information, some more boat fishing tips. Maybe we'll even catch something, who knows? But as you know out there, it's information that is king. I was going to be fishing aboard a Raider 18, that's an 18 foot long boat, out of the New Haven Small Boat Club with Chris Sparks. He was going to pop me out, have a go fishing for whatever. So I thought I'd let the tape run. You could just see how they go about launching their boats. I feel, I feel a bit bad actually filming what you guys are doing, all the pushing. We'll do this week, we'll do this week in, week out. But with, there's a lip there, yeah. which Over people there. moan about, and they say, oh, we're going to grind that out, and I always resist that and say, you don't want to do that, because to be quite honest with you, it stops your boat disappearing down the slip. Alright, that's tight then. Let it out about an inch. And and you want to do it so that it's going from the middle of it. Yeah. So, so there is a temptation tight on one end. Yeah, if, it, if the boat were to go, the whole try to flip, which will make things even worse, and your boat's still going around the river. So mm -hmm. I've got it rigged. So I've got a loop that's the right length for that. Yeah. So and it ties off on there like that. Okay. Well done. So that so that that's pulling in the centre of that. So if it did go. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to fall back on the trailer a bit. But what it's not going to do is launch down the river. Okay. It's just like slow motion compared to the ECA because they fire it in because it's on shingle. Yeah, yeah, well you'd have to, wouldn't you? But uh, that would scare the shit out of me, I think. There is a way of doing it quicker, but we don't show people how to do it. Yeah. Just coming under the bridge for a radio check over. Yes, okay, okay. Yeah, I can see that the ferry's steaming. Am I clear to leave or have I got to wait over? If you just uh, let her come out number one and proceed down the river, then um, you may follow at a safe distance. Yeah, all see, Roger. Thank you. Well, New Haven has a big rise and fall in tide. Anywhere down this end of the English Channel, the tide you know, has a big area there, a volume of water moving up and down the English Channel from east to west. And obviously with all those stanchions around, I thought, I wonder if there's any conger down there. And really, I sort of wanted to be up on the top there fishing with those beach guys, but no, we were out in the boat. And you see here the beach alongside New Haven is vast. Good fishing there, and yet no rods are out. Okay, Graham, so we've, we've arrived at our destination, and um, unfortunately it's slack water. We've arrived just in time for the slack, which is nice, because it means that we can have a little bumble around and look at it and look at the layer of the wreck. Um, and whilst we're waiting for the tide to start running some a few drifts and see if we can't pick up a pollock or two. So we've got what, 20 minutes, half hour for the yeah, time might think move? Yeah, we'll, we'll see it. We'll, we'll, we'll see it today because I think uh, the, the sea is so calm, isn't it? And there's no wind. 
you will suddenly see the boat start drifting in the opposite direction. Is... And, and depth rise, what are we going to be fishing in today? Uh, we are in 105 feet of water. So um, it's, it's in Dive Sussex, this boat. It, it's one that is dived. Um, it's not too deep for divers. Um, and if I can get it right, you'll, you'll see it come up on the sounder very shortly. So mostly pollock over here? Pollock, bass, cod. Um, obviously pouting are always present. Um, black bream. You know, it's, it, the world is our bivalve mollusk, as they say. You know, I would expect best case scenario is we'll get some pollock of it. Okay. Um, we came out on Sunday and the biggest one I had was about 10 pounds on a wreck very close to this actually. Um, there's a lot of small fish out here at the moment. We can't see them at the moment, but um, on Sunday there were huge flocks of gannets around. What do you reckon they feed in on Chris? I, it's got to be sprats. Oh, it's too early for mackerel. And, 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 and there's the wreck. And as I said, there's no secret numbers. It's a, it's a wreck, it's in Dive Sussex. It's listed in Dive Sussex as the Ashford. Um, uh, so if you want to look it up in Dive Sussex, there it is. And it will tell you all about what it was and how it, it sank. It was it'd been involved in a collision uh, and it, it was being towed. An old one, is it? Pretty old, uh, uh, I don't know, you'd have to look it up off the top of my head. Um, the way to fish for Pollock is retrieving a lure very slowly and drop your weight to the bottom with the lure attached and you wind it up at a nice steady speed, just enough to make the tail of that worm, whatever you're using, just wiggle or flash enticingly for the fish. You don't come up to the surface. I would suggest you generally go in the bottom half of the water, but of course, everywhere is different. And on this day, it was a bit of tough fishing, but we did luck out with some. Ordinarily, uh, when the tide's running, how many drops would you get up and down, you know, to, in the kill zone, as it were, when you say the tide's fast? Well, <laughs> this, this wreck lies across the tide, so you might get two drops on this tide, on a fast tide. And then, uh, and then it's back up again. And then you've got to go up, round up tide, and then come round again. So it's hard work day. It's a hard day's fishing uh, wrecking, I have to say. Um, uh, most, the majority of the wrecks out here lie along tide, because obviously they were steaming down the channel when they were sunk or hit by a torpedo or whatever, um, which makes them a little bit challenging to to drift over because they're narrow. But if you get it right, you're over the wreck for quite a time. So, so you can get three or four drops, and I've certainly had one wreck where we were having triple hookups, getting down and having another triple hookup. Ooh, I've touched there. A little bump? Yeah, a little bump there. So uh, coming off the bottom, uh, roughly what, 50 feet, something like that? Yeah, yeah, I mean the pollock sometimes sit quite high up off the tide, particularly, and bass as well, when the tide is not running like it is now, sometimes they're a long way up off the wreck. Um, when the tide starts to run, um, they tend to be a little bit closer into the, to the wreck, but at the moment we're in slack water. And, and, and what you've got to kind of do is feel the, the pace of, of winding because again, because it's slack water, sometimes you've got to wind quite fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you've got to try and... You to, know, make, to, to make, make the them, yeah. tail of the eel or jelly worm... Yeah, and also work. to sort of give, to give them that bite reflex, you know, they, they can, oh shit, and they'll go and chase after it and get it. Um, now you're going to go up again in a minute or shall I have a drop? No, I'll wait till you go up again. Because I think we're going to drift back over. We're, we're kind of, we're slack water, so we're, 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 we're over the top of wreckage now. Right. Let's get some gear out here, guys. Right, boys, this time Chris has got something. I was snagging the wreck a bit, but he's got a fish on this time. I say it's not a pouty. And several uh, bumps and bangs on the way up, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's see what it is in it. Yeah, it's a nice little pollock. Here we go. Only a small one. It's, uh, on the old sidewinder. Rhubarb and custard. That'd be a sort of average size for, for here, or would no, it get bigger small, than that? No, That'd be a small bigger, one, yeah? Yeah, smaller than that, no, bigger than that. But still, it's a beautiful fish. Hey, you fish to start, fish to start. Yeah. And that's why we're waiting for the tide before we go conga yeah. fishing. Yeah, we can keep it as bait, or we let it go back, which I reckon. Well, I've got, I've got some bait there, if you can go, if, you, if, he, if he's going to live. If not, you want to keep him, keep Yeah, it's gone. He's gone. There we go. Oh, nice pollock. Nice pollock. A bit more size. Oh, that's a bit of fish, isn't it? Yeah. Nearly, nearly a wet camera, but <laughs> yeah, much better. Mr. Sidewinder Lure. Good show. Nice fish. Nice. Welcome aboard. 
Okay, so the tide is just starting to run now, and so we're going to think about dropping our anchor. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to Alderney rig my anchor, which means that when we come to retrieve it, I haven't got to use lots of uh, grunt to do it. We actually use the boat to do it. And, and the way that works is that we have a large buoy, and it's, it has to be a large buoy, a buoy that is capable of suspending the anchor. Um, it's attached to what we call an Alderney ring, and that is a stainless steel ring, reasonable diameter, it doesn't want to be too small, because what will happen is that when we drop the anchor, the anchor walk will run through this ring, okay, and the buoy will be floating above the anchor walk. Now a little tip, and something that I use to good, good effort, is once we've, we're in and we've got the anchor set down and what have you, before I finally tie it off, I'm just going to put a peg through or across the anchor walk. That stops the buoy coming all the way up the anchor walk and then sitting underneath the bow of the boat. Now, there's a couple of benefits to that. The first benefit is when I come to retrieve it, I can see the buoy out ahead of the boat. Okay, so as I steam up tide to retrieve my anchor, I know which side of the buoy I'm gonna go to, uh, to pick the anchor up. The second benefit is that this buoy is sitting on the anchor walk and it, every time a wave hits the boat and it pushes it back, this acts like a big spring. So it's actually just shock absorbing the anchor. So it helps remove the risk of the anchor becoming pulled or pulling out. So I, I forget who showed me how to do this, but it definitely works. So we oh, we've got a bit of weight on the boat, yeah. yeah. Right, so that's the anchor down. So we're going to let it down a bit more. Sorry. No, it's all right. Close it. Peg through. Equation. That's a wreck there, is it coming up now? Is that just bait? Oh, that's probably, yeah, we might want to pull forward a little bit. That's all right, it's good. A couple of things you can see. You can see the pegs holding that, that Alderney ring, so, so it's not going to come up underneath the boat. Okay, and then this lazy line, we're going to pull this to the front of the boat. So we pull the anchor rope to the front of the boat, and then we'll tie the anchor off. Okay, Graham, well, the bait that I'm using today is baby cuttlefish. And without a doubt, this is the bait for conger eels. Right, if you can get them, get, I get these from Bickerstaff's, which is the fish market in New Haven. They keep them frozen there and you can go and buy a bag. They're not cheap, I have to say, but they're worth every penny. Better than squid, you reckon, yeah? Better than squid, much more meat to them. The solid, so they're not too long. Um, Nice, lots of guts in them. Nice bit of smell. You've got to take the, you've got to take that out. If you've got a budgie, you've always got plenty of those for your budgie. Um, but yeah, and I keep a freezer full of them if I can because in the in the winter when you can't get them, it is the cod bait bar none. Yeah, it is good cod bait. Cod bait bar none. These little cuttlefish, as I say, totally out of season in the winter because it's it's, it's this time of the year that they're getting them. Um, fantastic. If it was alive now. You want to be a little bit cautious of the of this set of, of its set of beaks there. That would give you quite a nasty bite, I suspect. Um, 
but yeah. They're a tough bait too, aren't they? It's tough. So one of the benefits of are you're always going to get pouting around wrecks. If you're using a bit of fish bait or whatever, you, the, the pouting shred, shred the fish bait. They can't really shred this. They nibble at it and chew at it and you get little nibbles around the outside of it, but it lasts a long time. And of course, the more they nibble at it, the more juices it's releasing. And what we want is old Charlie Conger to get a sniff of that and come out of the wreck to come and find what it smells so good. Okay, so we've, we've had a little bit of breeze um, and it's just swung us a little bit to the side. So we're just missing the wreck now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift the anchor and we're gonna reposition the boat so that we're back in the sweet spot. Um, we're in the car park, but we're not in the pub. Okay, so let's just back in the pub. doing this is you have to make sure you're keeping an eye on that anchor rope because what you don't want is it to go around your engine. And then it's just a simple task of drawing in this loose rope. We're not, we're not lifting up any great heavy anchors or anything like that. The anchor is floating underneath the buoy. Now, kind of a gross error check. You can see that the rope is going down now because it's going down to the end of the chain. The chain is up through my uh, Alderney ring and the anchor is hanging underneath the buoy. If, if we hadn't got it right and the anchor was starting to sink back to the bottom, you would feel it going. And that means you've got to stop doing what you're doing and have another go pulling it up. Which as you can see, the anchor rope is going down to the end of the chain and the chain is just hanging underneath the buoy. Because we're going to reposition, I'm not boxing the, the line. I'm going to make sure. Lemon squeezy. Worse than me. <laughs> Sorry. Nobody <I'm only> watching. <laughs> so, so here's a tip if, if you're Pollock fishing wrecks. I, I tend to favour these booms as my um, my preferred boom that keeps the, the, the line and the weight and the and the bait away from each other. Now you'll probably find that if you're using these booms, they are real difficult to thread the line through. So, so what I do on a cold winter's night is I get a packet of these booms and I thread a bit of line through, a bit of monofill through, and I tie it off so there's a loop at one end and I tie a swivel and a bead on the other end. And then I get, I'll have about 10 of these in my tackle box already tackled up uh, so that when I'm tackling up to, to uh, drift over a wreck, those are all ready to go. So it's literally clip it onto a swivel on the end of my rod, clip my hook -like length on at the other end, and attach away, and I, and I tend to use, rather than using swivels and etc. and what have you, I use a little bit of kitchen, uh, sorry, uh, garden wire. Uh, so you, you can twist it on, and you can twist it on as strong as you like. So if, you, if, if you're worried about losing equipment and you, and you want to have a, a sort of a, a safe breakout, you need, only need to put this on with one twist. So that if you then, if the weight gets caught in the wreck, it's going to free and, and, and go, be left behind and you can bring the rest of your gear out. Or if you want to make sure it's on and it's not coming off, then obviously you, you can wind it up and twist it on nice and tight. But that is just garden wire that you can buy from any garden shop. And so that's it. And you can buy these online um, or in tackle shops in packets of six or ten or you know, from some of the companies like Veals, you can get big packs of them. And as I say, just make them up. That's if it. you try and use this 
with um, with a braid, you will find it is almost impossible to thread braid through these. You know, it, it's very difficult. So a bit of monofill, a couple of knots, a bead and a swivel. Okay, well, we've had a good day's fishing and, and we haven't actually caught a great deal, but it was a beautiful day out here and, and on a day like today, fish are a bonus. And we're gonna steam back in. But one of the things I always do before I steam back in is I just make sure that I'm running on a fuel tank, a full tank of fuel, because what I don't want to be doing is running out of fuel as we're going into the harbour. And also it's not good, it's not good to run the tanks dry. So I'm just gonna swap over to a full tank so I'm sure I've got a full tank on. Make sure that we've clicked this in and it's clicked in, it's not just hanging in there. And the last thing, make sure that you undo the vent, because otherwise your tank is just going to suck and, and collapse. Push it back into place. There is actually plenty of fuel in the first tank, but uh, as I've said a million times, I always like belt and braces. enjoyed that fishing do you know what it's not always about big fish is it it's about enjoying that day fishing now another thing I enjoyed was babysitting that's right I got a call from Mike he said can you look after our young one I thought oh, I've got I've had kids I've, I've done all that nappy changing I've been up in the middle of the night all that business at two and at three and at four well actually I woke the wife up you know to say go and sort that boy out go and sort that daughter out they're your daughter and that's your son. That's the way you do it, isn't it, man? And he can stay in bed a bit longer. Anyhow, I thought this one could be trouble. It's a male. You know what boys are like. And this boy is a bit of a tough one to handle. We're going to go for it. We're going to try and babysit him. We thought if we take him out in the countryside somewhere, he might sort of calm down because he's a sort of hyperactive person. And when I say person, I mean I speak the same language as him, luckily. Um, I can converse with this type of person. Anyway, he's due here any minute. I think he's, I think he's coming in now. Oh, I better get ready for him. That sounds like him now. That sounds like him now. Do you want to go? This is dog talk. This is Mike's young one. Do you want to go? Wait for this. Hunting. He wants to go hunting. He wants to go. Oh, he's going. Oh, he's going. Oh, he's going. Oh, he's going. You want to go? We don't want to. Now listen. What do you want to hunt? Do you want to hunt? Squirrels. He hates squirrels. Does he, does he want to hunt? Wait, wait. Do you know the other animal? The arch enemy of all. Wait, it's, 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 wait, wait, I haven't even told you who we're hunting. We're hunting. It's coming. Wait. Pheasant, pheasant. And his worst one. Deer, he's going for deer. Let's go, let's go. That's a quick visit. Right, let's get him in the car and we get him out. And he's raring to go. Wait a minute, babe. Always got to make sure we're at the top of this hill. Here, here, here. Look. I thought he needed some water. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. So here we are. We're on the picnic with the young one, babysitting, and we've come to the top of Old Winchester Hill, which is also a nature reserve. It's in Hampshire, and when you get to the top of this, I think there used to be like an old Iron Age fort or something there. But, you know, as you can see in the background, 
a massive amount of yellow oilseed rape goes over there and it is absolutely fabulous so we just gave the dog a drink his name's Jack belongs to Mike and hopefully we get him to the top of the hill to get together with the wife of course the wife's on a lead as well and then we'll see have a little picnic and show you some of the scenery you can see from way up high on the hill Well, we've got base camp established here, just on the top of the hill, I would say is a southeast corner of Old Winchester Hill. We're going to give old Boise over there, who's sitting down, as you can see, on top of the hill, going to give him some more water and a few pips, which Mike gave us, and he put it in the water as well. So these are little fold-out dishes, which you can use for water, look, and they pop out, and you can put your food in there, which he's waiting for, our man here is waiting for it, aren't you, babe? But they also sort of dehydrate, I think, so you, you, you need to put water with them as well. That way he gets a drink at the same time. This is all baby fight. This is like what you, you would do with a baby, really. There we go, mate. There. He might not eat because he's too hot. He's actually wanting the water a bit more than he wants the... Uh, the food. Yeah, he's not hungry, he's thirsty. So what else you do, you get some water, you can put it over their fur, and that helps cool them off. I think it might cool them off as well. He's enjoying life, look. So, although we have this baby to babysit, I have no problem with dogs, because I've had three of these Jack Russells for 45 years. And uh, they're very loyal dogs. Very sharp, very good ratting, aren't you, mate? Good ratty. He likes this grass, that's for sure. I just hope he's not rolling in anything nasty. Come on, son. Come on, son. Yeah, yeah. Good boy. Good boy. Imagine what you could do with your fingers when you hear that crunching noise here. Good boy. Well, the doggy's out his and I'm gonna have mine and I've got prawn and mayonnaise sandwiches and as you can see, he's got his eye on that as well. But that is a Jack Russell. Generally, they'll eat anything. Mmm, that is tasty. A saucepan, mice cooker, and a couple of cups of tea. You cannot beat that with a view like this. Now anyone who's got a dog knows they go ripping around doing all that digging up. But with a Jack Russell, if there's a hole, he's going to find it. And yes, he's going to sniff around for rabbit droppings and where the fox has been. And is there a badger in there? Watch down that hole, anywhere there's a hole in the ground, yes, he's going to sniff and see what's in there. They can't help it. They were actually designed for ratting years ago. And they have an acute sense of hearing. Well, Jack's does here, that's for sure. A very sharp, bright dog. Great one to have. What's down there? What's down there? Don't you go down there, would you? They could be bunny rabbit. So you can see here, if he can get his head and body down that hole, and if there was a rabbit down there, he is long gone. He would get down and we'd probably never get him out. Probably need a shovel to dig him out, I should think. Now, the wife is tied to um, the lead there with her chair. You can see the fabulous view she's watching. I'm sure you wouldn't be a fabulous view if a rabbit came out the hole bolted and Jack took after him. He'd probably drag the wife across the fields. We were something of a, well, a, a really weird 
early summer, I'm going to call it, spring type day, late spring day. And look at the view zooming right in there, even down right to the tractor. What a setting. Well, I've got my lead and I'm going to take our man Jacks for a walk around, a tour along the ramparts, I'm going to call it. Come on, up here. So you can see these are actually like ramparts up there. And this fort goes all the way around the edge. I'm going to walk you around it and you can see the fabulous scenery we got. I'm leaving the wife up there, the speck in the distance. Come on. Look, they give you exercise as well, don't they? You can interact with watching them look, sniff, spot things, hunt things, everything. You're looking at what they're doing and they're enjoying the day. So you're enjoying the day. I'm not a cat person, I have to say. I am a dog person, particularly a Jack Russell type dog. Go on! What a view, what a glorious day after a great day's fishing. Coming out the next day, and do you know what's good about this, people? What's good about this is that the wife's going to be so happy, she's going to give me even more time off to go fishing. See up here, this is the bank. It comes right up here, and the secondary bank rises up there. So they would have been at the top, one assumes they would have been, I don't know what they've been throwing, rocks down to protect their, uh, their village inside. But what intrigues me is it's going to be very windswept up here. And yet look at this, it's like some sort of monster bonsai plant. And it looks absolutely ancient, ouch, and absolutely sharp. So what type of wood is that? And how old is it? Is this as old as the fault that was here? And obviously they get sheep here. You can see all the wool. They're, well, they must be quite tall sheep actually. And are these, look at this one. Is that some form of ancient artifact, I asked myself. A pummeling device. Anyway, I'm gonna tow around the uh, perimeter, show you some of the views from the top. Doggy's gonna come with me and then he's gonna have a thesis on what he's done during the day and he'll have to write it out for his homework. Won't you, Jax? Sniff, sniff. Up, 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 get those joints going. Oh dear. Now Jax, at this time of writing, is what, two and a half years old? Two and three quarter years old, and dogs are supposed to be seven years for every human year. Two sevens are 14, 15, 16, he's 17 and a half. That is trouble. I've got a teenager, come here. What a view. It goes even higher over there, so. I can have a look over this side as well. From here I can see the Isle of Wight down through there. If I stand dead still, you guys won't see it with that haze that the Isle of Wight is way, way in the distance. I can see the sea shimmering in between. We possibly are 500 feet high here. It would be a brilliant spot for droning, but you're not allowed to have drones flying up here. Fair play, but it is impressive. Now this is a view down here if I move slowly to sort of the southwest, honestly, with weather like this, all the sheep with the lambs down there all laying in the sunshine, some feeding, some not, some just sleeping. Would you want to be anywhere else, really? We haven't got much left in England, really. It's getting built on all over the place. But when you see it like this, under these conditions, it does really lift the spirits a bit. And with the dog, it gets lifted twice. Come on, boy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. That is incredible, that view. I stand still because it's only a, it's only my head cam. Oh, doggy's going mad for some smell. Rabbits, I would, I would just guess it's a rabbit. Great big hill back there. You can park up the top. So this is old Winchester Hill in Hampshire. I don't know which way Winchester is. I would think back that way but it really is an impressive spot. Let's get right to the top. Like all children, we've got to go to the top. Come on, doggy. Now we're gonna go up the hill. Listen, wait, wait, wait for me. We're gonna go up the hill. Listen, you know what's at the top? A squirrel or oh deer. Can you catch him? First one up, on your marks. Get set, he's ready, go. Got no chance, no chance. 68 year old man seen running after white dog. God. Get 
down there, he's going first. Oh, I can't keep up with him. Whew. And there we go. This is where they, uh, this is where they, this is where they put old men who can't run up hills. This is where they would put coordination devices to fan across there and get um, different levels of degrees. And if we look at this, we're right on the top of it now. It says here, Old Winston Hill National Nature Reserve. The panorama from the Ordnance Survey Trig. I guess trigonometry, January 74. Well, I thought we were 500 feet. It's 648 feet. All distances shown are in miles, unless otherwise stated. I thought Winchester was over that hill. And there are other hills. Southampton is that way. Oh, it doesn't tell me. Chichester Harbour, the area I fish from, is that way. So there you go, folks. You are on top of Old Winchester Hill which was originally a fault at the oilseed rape and there's specks of people on the horizon just down there there's people just walking back and i think that's where we're off now we've had a great time it's windy up here it's not cold at all we've got to find the wife does anybody find excuse me anybody up here know where my good lady wife is They're on top of the world oh look this is interesting <laughs> The tide must come up here a long way. Somebody's left a rod rest. I'll tell you where you don't get many days where you can uh, come on top of a 650 feet hill and not get blasted by a freezing wind. It's like a hot air dryer today. And I feel I could go carp fishing tomorrow. Oh, there's a good lady back this way. Back this way. Yeah, boy. You can see all the lambs there. They've got the early spring lambs. In fact, they're growing up now, but you can see each one of those sheep has either one or two lambs with it just laying down there. So an idyllic setting, it's nice to see natural, well, farming as it was done for centuries, really. And as I pull back with the camera, you can see there wonderful no houses. It's got to be worth the climb up the hill alone. Even Jack's a dog is impressed. Although, if he can get over that barbed wire fence, you know, you can see he's looking all the time. Well, what was that? See how sharp his reflexes were. He's heard somebody about 200 yards away. There's nobody near us, but he's zoned up trying to see or hear what's coming. Sharp dog, sharp teeth. And he's listening with those ears. And I often wonder, you know, what do they pick up first? Do they pick up, sorry, didn't mean to say that. Do they pick up smell, the scent, or do they pick up hearing? I don't know which they pick up, but he's having a roll around while he's putting his scent all over the grass, having a shake up. And, well, let's face it guys, what's next? Like a young one? Oh, here we go, here we go. Don't tell me he's not a, rat, a natural ratting dog. He's down the next hole he can find. Right, filthy nose, look at him. Mice, rats, you better move on guys, because this dog is going to find you. So the fort here is an old hill fort, as you can read, 3,800 years ago, a settlement was there. Bronze Age, I thought it was Iron Age, it's all the same to me, it's metal. But you can see there, look, the little cone-shaped huts they lived in right on top of the surround. And we were sitting sort of in the bottom of the picture before the hill slopes away there. So like some sort of protection and battlement, but I often wonder. Did they put those sort of fence or edge up because of the wind on top of the hill or to protect themselves from 
other invaders. Now they're only invaded by the occasional rambler, walker, bird watcher, or indeed, like we were, dog walkers. So that's ended my babysitting period afternoon here. Great fun. Back into the lion's cage he goes, ready for a snap and a snarl. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. And, of course, we will have another one for you next week. Hit the subscribe button on this channel. And, of course, TA Outdoors. And there'll be more films to come. Hey,